Welcome back to the show, everybody. Check out these headlines as we wait for the spot Bitcoin ETF approval. Now there's being floated an XRP ETF may be on the way. And we've got that and so much more. You're going to want every single bit of it. What makes XRP so special? Oh, you're going to find out today. Somebody roll that beautiful intro. Digital Perspectives with Brad Kimes. Come on in. Welcome back to the show. You can follow us on Twitter and YouTube for exclusive content. Right now, $1.74 trillion market cap for crypto. The market is up 1%. 44,300 plus for Bitcoin at the moment, 2,200 plus for Ethereum. Tether market cap is 93.5 billion plus, and we see number six spot XRP at 56 cents, off by 0.1 in the 24 hour, off by 8.6 on the seven day. Let's look at the range of price very quickly here. 56 cents is where we're sitting, and the bottom is 56 cents, and the top is 57. So we got a pretty tight trading range at the moment. We'll keep an eye on it as we move forward. But I want to share this with you because I am so very excited, privileged, and honored. We know Ripple is going to be at XRP Las Vegas 24, and so will I Trust Capital, so will Uphold, so will Link to, so will so many others that I can't even say yet. But I am super privileged and honored that we are going to have Perry Ann Boring from the Chamber of Digital Commerce. Yes, David Schwartz, the CTO of Ripple on stage, Eleanor Terrett from Fox Business News, and the Honorable Christian Carlo, the co-founder of the Digital Dollar Project, and so many more. I tell you, Watch out, ladies and gentlemen. You better get your tickets. This is absolutely going to sell out before the event happens. So do not mess around. Make sure you get your ticket. Let's start here with a piece of news from Perry Ann Boring from the Chamber of Digital Commerce that she says here in response to a clip of the former SEC chair, Jay Clayton, says spot Bitcoin ETF approval is eventually inevitable. She makes a great comment here. I agree that the spot Bitcoin ETF are inevitable, but let's not forget that Mr. Jay Clayton blocked the spot Bitcoin ETFs during his tenure as SEC chair during the Trump administration. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And we can't forget that as Jay Clayton sits here with all this clarity now that he's no longer the SEC chair. He was doing the same stuff that Gary Gensler is today. John Deaton agrees and concurs here. He says, without Jay Clayton's self-serving tenure at the SEC, Gensler would not have been able to arbitrarily and capriciously deny a spot ETF. He was 100% wrong to block the ETF. Remember as well, Clayton met with Gensler the day before he filed the Ripple XRP case, claiming all XRP constituted illegal securities, which he's lost on. If you don't believe the Ripple XRP case was the main topic of discussion, Clayton left the SEC the following day. I have a bridge to sell, sell for sale. He says, after refusing to implement a safe harbor proposed by Hester Peirce, and after making sure he kept the regulatory status of Bitcoin and crypto vague, Clayton went on to advise One River and others related, of course, to Bitcoin, Ethereum, crypto policy in general. Pretty damn good business model for Clayton and his cronies, that is. Absolutely right. And you shouldn't be allowed to go work into a sector that you just regulated, right? They, they need to cut that part out. And I think the biggest thing is, if we get back to the idea of serving government in the same manner that you do jury duty, that's where we need to get. The term career politician needs to go away. It should be impossible for someone to spend a lifetime in politics. That's my personal view. That's going to help right there, right? You look at it like jury duty, you go do it, it's three months, whatever, and then you back out, gone. That's it. You can only serve once in each level of office. Now let's hear this. The Bitcoin ETF approval will pave the way for Bitcoin options market. You can see how excited all of the institutions are to get these products in place so they can begin to build a real market on top of this di new digital asset. Take a listen here. Do we know that there is going to be an options market automatically? Like if the SEC approves it, 
Do they approve it all? Is there then options? So then it, is, is then it would game? go to the actual options dealers to decide effectively when they want to do this. Now, when GLD got options, there was a bit of a hiccup there about how it was going to be cleared, et cetera. I have a feeling those conversations have long since happened already. Everybody understands that the options market on this is going to be enormously valuable and enormously powerful. I mean, we, you guys have talked about it a ton of times. Single, you know, People trading zero-date expiration mm -hmm. options is almost replacing people trading stocks in some cases. That is what they're after. And you know that the institutions are drooling to be able to get in here and to build all these products on top of this new asset class. No question about it. Then there's this. Shout out to Jeremy Hogan for this. He says, someone just sent Satoshi's Genesis wallet $1.2 million in Bitcoin. Why? The only thing that makes any sense is that the sender is flushing Satoshi out. Under the new IRS rule, you have to report any receipt of crypto over $10,000. So Satoshi has to dox himself or break the law. <laughs> but why almost $1.2 million? So it can be argued that he failed to notice the transfer. You might miss 0.2 Bitcoin. But over 26 Bitcoin? No way. Okay, it's not the best argument, but I'm intrigued. What the hell is the kids say? Absolutely. You know, this is really interesting to me because it does put it in a position, and we all know if we've done the work, Department of Homeland Security has admitted at a conference years ago in front of the SEC and the CFTC that they know exactly who the four Satoshis are, and they went and interviewed them. So this gets quite interesting. Will the IRS continue to turn a blind eye and act like they don't know that there's a wallet attached to real people? <laughs> uh, as the world turns, we'll keep an eye on it. This here from Amelay here says, wow, rumors revealed an XRP ETF to be released within weeks. Now we're looking for a bit of a collective effort from the audience here. This is unconfirmed reports. So you know we tend to get a little questionable on that. But nevertheless, it's suggesting that BlackRock, the world's largest asset manager, has submitted registration for an XRP exchange traded fund. If they have, this is big. Specula speculation reached a fever pitch on social media with rumors circulating about BlackRock's alleged registration of a spot XRP ETF. It says it's named iShares XRP Trust while similar rumors surfaced in September. Now, what I can tell you is this. Take a look at this. Shout out to Mike Jansen for this. He did find this. Fidelity. It says, Amon Ripple AXRP ETP. Now, I don't know what it, if it's, you know, he found this, he shared this. So maybe... We can all work together to figure out, is this something that is launched already? I don't see a price here. Is this about to launch? Is this anticipation of releasing something? What is this? So maybe collectively we can all help find an answer because it does look like some kind of XRP ETP is on its way. We'll see. That was Fidelity. So we'll see if BlackRock's doing it too. But let's get to this. This is a former clip here, and uh, shout out to Emily for bringing this out because I'm going to play this clip, and then the next clip I'm going to play is a brand new clip from Quincy Jones. Both of these clips set up the importance of what XRP can do and what I believe will be a massive role in the financial system moving forward. Take a listen to Joe Endoso from Link2 explain how Bank of America can use XRP in the liquidity hub. This is remarkable. Institutions, financial institutions, certainly like Bank of America to transact. I, I think it was actually quite timely and maybe fully intended uh, that Ripple created and introduced this liquidity hub product. Because what I'd be doing if I were in Ripple shoes today is I'd be integrating liquidity hub into the RippleNet product. So every user of RippleNet like Bank of America would simply port into Liquidity Hub as the means of obtaining and managing that XRP position that they need to work through ODL. Right? Liquidity Hub is 
just a massive, um, you know, smart router engine. It has feeds to uh, accounts that Ripple has opened across all the liquidity venues around the world. Basically, virtually every exchange where there is depth of liquidity, it has accounts at. So if I'm Bank of America, I, I become a liquidity hub customer and on any given moment or, you know, where I need, you know, pick a number, a billion dollars worth of XRP to transact, I plug that into liquidity hub and liquidity hub will break that billion dollars up into fractions and route them for execution and closing across all the exchanges to get the optimal average acquisition price for XRP. And then when I'm done using the XRP for ODL, I turn around and I go the opposite direction and I have that same smart engine route my sell order and go back to cash. And that's what I want to do. Sell the XRP across all the venues to get the optimal price for Bank of America, right? And at no time do I ever have to be in a position where I'm actually taking XRP from Ripple itself. I'm doing it through all of these exchanges. And what Ripple will be do in that instance is it'll be on an ongoing basis looking at the XRP available across all those exchanges worldwide and just distributing XRP through those exchanges. It, it, it will sell XRP into those exchanges to create supply. And there you have that. Now, it's a wonderful explanation. Nobody does it better than Joe. And I'm going to tell you right now, uh, this is Quincy Jones. We were fortunate enough to have Quincy on stage with us at XRP Las Vegas 2023. And we are privileged and honored to have him be on stage with us again in 2024. And you are not going to want to miss the, the conversation he's going to have with you. He is absolutely electrifying as he is in this video. So shout out to everyone that made this video possible, even here, Psych722, uh, uh, for, for, I guess, uh, catching this call here or whatever it is. But I want you to hear how he explains what makes XRP so special and listen how it ties in exactly with what Joe Adoso talked about, which is the routing how you can route through an algorithm, basically maximizing the liquidity. Take a listen. That's special. A lot, of these other, a lot of the other things, are, there's a lot of overlap. And don't get me wrong, there are some things where it's not proof of stake or proof of work, but that's not what makes it special. That's what makes it maybe unique, not what's special. The two things that make it special is one, the entire network is a debt. What does that mean? It means anybody from their individual wallet can list an asset for sale into the debt. There you don't you have go. to go to a debt. You don't have to go to third. The entire network is a debt. In that debt is a liquidity routing algorithm that allows you to maximize liquidity between any asset that you, or maximize the, max, it, it automatically routes, um, it automatically routes the asset to maximize liquidity. So the whole premise of this is no liquidity pool. There's an algorithm that keeps you, so any, any other exchange, any other DEX, any other everything has liquidity pools. XRP does not. It has an algorithm that maximizes liquidity by being able to route, um, by being able to route and um, liquidate the asset based on what's available on the network. Those are the two things that make XRP amazing. Now you can get into the speed, you can get into it's not proof of work, proof of stake, you can get into all that too. But those two things, the fact that the entire network, the debt, and there's an algorithm that maximizes liquidity on that debt, is the two biggest things that when people talk about cross-border remittances, currency, no Shrevosho, that allows for the instant liquidity of any asset like it's cash. You see what I mean? I, I love his passion. It is so fire. I absolutely love it. And I absolutely do understand exactly what you mean, uh, Quincy. And it's an excellent breakdown. And, you know... Um, I also want to add in, think about the addition of automated market makers once they finally pass and make their way to the ledger, right, on the public ledger. So this will be, as he said, you don't have liquidity pools at this time. You have the algorithm. But when you start to create the automated market makers and get them out there and working, and then you do create liquidity pools that can be used for transactions, no longer do you have to rely on the buy 
and sell orders of the prices of XRP when you can go to a liquidity pool and you can begin to stabilize that price while allowing the open free market to still move up in price because of the demand for the asset itself. I hope that that makes sense to everyone because it certainly makes sense to me. Uh, what a remarkable moment we are in. I really do believe that. Now let's take a look at this. The ongoing legal battle between Ripple Labs and a group of XRP investors led by Zakhanov is set to reach a pivotal moment on January 11th as both parties prepare for a significant court hearing. So I just want to remind people, this is not the SEC versus Ripple. This is the case that actually came out before that one, where Zakhanov came out and said, hey, I lost a few hundred bucks It's a, because it's a security and I didn't know that, right? And this is going to be a significant hearing. So January 11th here. So another four days, we're going to hope to hear something that really aligns with what we've already learned and had in rulings for SEC versus uh, Ripple and XRP and hopefully the decision in the Judge Annalisa Torres uh, ruling helps to inform this case in a proper way to keep us moving in the right direction but we'll bring it all to you. Now right now we're getting ready to head into the Freedom Zone I hope you will join us We've been taking it on ladies and gentlemen This here is the co-founder of Greenpeace has now become a whistleblower of what the powers to be and the puppet masters are trying to do to all of us and our food supply. It is quite evil. I, I kid you not. You're going to want to know about it. And I remind everyone that censorship is very real and it is the reason that we've created the Freedom Zone. And that's why I hope you'll go to digperspectives.com and click the button for the Freedom Zone and join us on the inside. Not financial advice from me or anyone else. I'll catch all of you on the next one.